Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. I'm Emeritus Professor Glenn McConnell from Victoria University in Australia. The idea behind Inside Exercise is to bring to you the absolute who's who of exercise research. So exercise physiology, exercise metabolism, and exercise and health. And what I'm really wanting is for you to get your exercise information from the research experts rather than from influencers. And indeed, today I bring to you Professor Brian Heiderscheidt from the University of Wisconsin in the United States. He's an expert on running injuries. And as you'll see, this is actually the third podcast episode in a row where we talk about running injuries. So different aspects of running injuries, but um, it's really interesting. And I think it's very important that you actually watch and or listen to all three of the episodes. So we had a really good chat about all sorts of things related to running injuries uh, and the causes. So a big one uh, we talked about was overstriding and how that can cause running injuries and how you can potentially try and alleviate this by doing some sort of gait retraining. And because Brian was the third in the series of uh, discussions about running injuries, it was really quite useful to go back and compare and contrast uh, what he feels are the important contributors to running injuries compared with what Irene Davis and Rasmus Ostergo nielsen uh, felt were the main contributors. So we saw there's a lot of common ground uh, between the three of them, but there were some differences. Uh, so for example, Irene is a big fan of using minimalist shoes and uh, trying to land on the forefoot rather than the rear foot and thinks that's a big contributor to injuries. So you can go back and have a look at uh, her podcast episode. While Brian doesn't really think that's as much of a factor, but there were some differences in whether they think, think you should change your gait or not, um, how you would change your gait, and a few other differences. Um, but one, one that was interesting that all three agree on is that yeah, there isn't really a need, they don't feel, to have these sort of shoes that try and prevent excess pronation. All three of them feel that the injury rates are pretty similar if you have neutral shoes versus shoes that prevent over uh, that try and prevent excess pronation. So that was interesting. But they all agree that you know people should change things very gradually to reduce the chance of injuries. I found the whole thing and the whole series of, of talks really interesting. I think you will too. So stick around. Now, if you'd like to do me a favor and also increase the awareness of inside exercise, please like, subscribe leave comments, and also leave reviews on the respective platforms about Inside Exercise that would help get the message out. Also, as usual, it's much better if you uh, watch or listen to the whole podcast episode. But if you'd like to jump around a little bit, you can look down in the notes and you'll see there's timestamps. On YouTube, you can click on the time and it will take you automatically to that point. Uh, and, and on the other podcast platforms, you can just manually move to that point. Okay, so enjoy the chat with Brian Heideshardt. Hi, Brian. Welcome to Inside Exercise. How are you doing there? I'm doing well, Glenn. How are you? Oh, good. Good, thanks. Um, all right. So avid listeners and watchers of the podcast will know that this is the th actually third in a row of um, discussions with different experts on running injuries. And um, I thought I might just see if you mind just giving a little quick sort of similarities and differences um, that you have in your mindset about causes of, of running injuries between yourself and Irene Davis and Rasmus, uh, let's get this right, Ostergo Nielsen, and uh, you're the third one. Um, so, you know, I'd, I'd, obviously it would be best if people went back and watched those whole podcasts, but just just a bit of a, a, a summary. Yeah, happy to. Um, I, I know both Irene and, and Rasmus very well, so we've had a chance to interact over the years, and um, it's... Uh, it's an honor to be included in the panel with those three, or at least in the in the, in the group of three that you have on, on running uh, experts. So uh, Irene and I have known each other for a, quite a while and have had a chance to present at various conferences. And anybody who's heard us present know that we tend to butt heads occasionally and mm -hmm. in a completely respectful and professional manner. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's one where we, we, we have a lot of similarities in our approaches, but we don't necessarily agree on, on each other's uh, key premises at times. So for example, Irene is a, a big advocate of four foot running and that uh, vertical loading rate as derived from the ground reaction forces are, is a key metric of running injury risk. Uh, our research, my research has been less convincing of either of those that you know, to the point where we generally don't look at loading rate any longer, at least as it relates to the vertical mm -hmm. ground reaction force curve. 
and forefoot strike versus rear foot strike, I, I am not too concerned of one over the Thank other, um, at least not at a, a population level. At an individual level, there might be reason where we would uh, suggest one over the other based upon a number of other factors that interact. Um, and that actually leads quite well into, well, I should say then, where, where Irene and I do agree very well is the need at times for gait retraining and that how valuable modifying a runner's gait can be under the right circumstances, under the right, for, for the right amount and for the right reason. You know, not a one size fits all approach at, for any reason, but in the event that somebody's having recurrent injuries and it can be reasonably established that their mechanics are, are a likely contributor to those, then it's a worthwhile uh, uh, opportunity to modify gait mechanics at that time. Mm. Rasmus and myself, Rasmus is an excellent epidemiologist who's done a tremendous amount of work looking at a number of factors and not just how each factor individually may affect running injury risk, but how the interaction of these factors and really doing some nice data analytics to be able to, for us to understand those in a large population scale of novice runners, recreational runners. He's done a tremendous work in that space and uh, really helped us to, to demystify a lot of the myths that have been promoted over the years. Mm. Yeah. So I, I'd encourage people to go back and watch those. And um, so if I just give my, cause that the way you summarize that is, is like, yep, yep. Tick, tick is, is in my, in my mind, the things I picked up on. So I guess the one thing Irene was talking a lot about um, how, you know, in terms of evolution, you know, we haven't had had these cushion cushion shoes, you know, since since you know, only since the seventies. So you know, minimalist sort of shoes. She was a fan of, and she was saying that makes you tend to run to land more on the forefoot. And she was saying, you know, that, that then therefore the force the forces are different, and you're less likely to get injured and things. So it sounds like you you're not, and also Rasmus, I think, was not not such a you know a worry about the shoes. I, I think. For example, so if people want to think about minimalist shoes and things, uh, have have a definitely have a listen to Irene's, and um, and then as she said, and I was actually quite surprised that, that you know her and you, um, I always thought because I was an, I was an old ex, well I'm a, a very injured distance runner, so maybe I should change my views. Um, I always thought don't change your gait, you know the classic thing of you know Michael John Johnson, you know winning the two hundred and four hundred world records with this you know this gate of sort of leaning back and people say, Oh, if he lent 40, he'd go like a second faster. And it's like, well, he's already got the world record, but um, yeah, it's interesting. So I've got to think more about that. And let's talk more about that because maybe I should think about changing my gate. Um, but then, and then, as you said, Rasmus was really interesting because me, like, like a cl classic sort of distance runner mindset, I would think of load as, Oh, how many kilometers a week am I running? You know, oh, mm -hmm. I'm still running, you know, hundred K's a week. Like, that's fine. I haven't increased it too much or whatever. But, you know, obviously when he says it, you go, oh, yeah, of course, you know, how much, what's your, what's your terrain? Are you running on grass more or less? What about hills? What about even your leisure time activity? What about, you know, you just painted the house for the last week, but you, oh, you're still going to do my 100Ks a week, you know? So that was really, really interesting. So I definitely encourage people to go back to that and have a listen to those. But, um, yeah, so why don't we talk? Well, actually, I'm interested in in, in how you got into research. So you look, look like a bit of a lean, mean machine there you um not mean but you, you know you're a distance <laughs> runner that got into research where you were a researcher that got into distance running and actually by the way i always think distance running because it's my background but i see you've got a lot of research on hamstring mm -hmm. tears and, and sprinting and things like that so i'm wondering maybe you were a sprinter and got into research did you i wish i was a sprinter number one i'm not <laughs> nearly fast enough to be classified as a sprinter okay um and distance running uh, again i would I would plead that I'm middle of the pack at best. And that's only been later in years. Uh, early on, my sports were all team-based sports, baseball, basketball. You know, running was one of those punishments that the, the coach handed out. So, uh, but I got into running really more of out of my research when I'm, I did some uh, research in physical therapy uh, school and had an opportunity to have it published and really got the bug for research. And so I knew I was going to go on to do a PhD um, and I really gravitate toward biomechanics in general and, and, and biomechanics of injury, biomechanics of musculoskeletal injury. Um, I still hadn't decided that running injuries were where I wanted to be, but I was really interested more in the interaction of pain and biomechanics and what those what that looked like. Keep in mind, this was back in the mid-1990s. 
Um, and so, you know, I had an opportunity to to study with one of the best running uh, biomechanists in the world at the time at University of Massachusetts, Joe Hamill, uh, and took a chance at it, still not convinced that running was what I was going to do, but he was such a strong biomechanist that I knew I could at least learn that side of it. Well, lo and behold, I, I did end up getting into running for my research uh, on, on knee pain, essentially, because again, two out of every five runners experience knee pain every year. So it's it's a pretty good odds that you're going to uh, see individuals who develop this. Um, but then out of that, I learned, I, I gained an appreciation for running and the role it can play in life uh, and lifestyle overall. And so I began to run in graduate school and, and I've kept it up ever since. All right, great. Okay, so that's an interesting one I wasn't aware of, I guess. So so two out of every five people every year, runners, will have knee pain. Is that right? Well, roughly speaking, I mean, the numbers are generally that about 40% of all running injuries at a, yeah. at a prevalence level are involved in knee joint. Uh, okay. And so knee pain, you can expect yeah. that to be the case as well. Now, whether that translates to an incidence of two out of every five per year, uh, give or give or take, but it's probably pretty yeah. close in the end. All right. So if we start talking about, I guess this will bring everything to, to, in together. If we start thinking about, okay, so why are these forty percent of people, on average, having knee pain? Then then we start thinking about, oh, is it the shoes? Is it the load? Is it the you know they landing on their forefoot, their rear foot? You know, all of this stuff will start to get come together anyway. So right. so why do you think on average? Well, okay, it's gonna be some are going to be this cause, some are going to be this cause. But what are some of the reasons they get these injuries? So I think the majority of it is that the knee is one of your primary energy absorbers during running, right? Unless you're a forefoot runner, then it's your ankle joint. And so it's not that the forefoot runners necessarily have lower loads overall. It just shifts as to where those loads are. Ankle, you know, okay. ankle is more likely to be loaded versus the knee. Um, and you see the same sort of thing in terms of what sort of injuries develop in forefoot versus. Sorry, can I just trainers. ask you why? Why is that? Um, why? Why is what? Uh, why is it if you land on your forefoot, it's it's more the ankle and and you. Yeah. So when you, when you land on your forefoot, you're creating what we would call an a, an a, a joint torque at the ankle that will cause an eccentric contraction of your calf muscles of your plantar flexors. So that eccentric contraction is creating an energy absorption uh, through the ankle joint as it moves into dorsiflexion as your heel tends to drop down. And then, of course, you have the push-off phase, which is the concentric portion of the gait cycle, all calf. So you end up having this large calf-dominant energy absorption phase and calf-dominant energy generation phase during running. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry. Can I just make sure people are clear on that? So, because yep. even the eccentric concept. So eccentric is when you're contracting your muscles, but they're lengthening. So if you think about right. if you're doing a bicep curl, when you're lifting it up, the muscle's shortening while it's contracting, which is concentric. And then when you're lowering it, the muscle's still contracting. You're not just like dropping it to the floor. You're lowering it, but it's lengthening. That's eccentric. So you're saying that you're, so when you're landing on your forefoot, so the more, you know, not at the, on the heel, but further forward, your uh, Achilles in, in calf is it as uh, uh, stretching while they're contracting, which is eccentric. Right. And right. then you're contracting, uh, shortening to take off again. So you're saying there's a lot of load there on the on the calf and the Achilles, yeah? And you're saying but, that is less if you land on your heel. Right? Well, the the I mean, we're not necessarily going to get into the magnitudes of loads because those come down into the details of it, but mm -hmm. it just shifts where the loads are. So okay. if you're on your forefoot, now you've incorporated the ankle into your energy absorption phase. Yes. If you land on your heel, you don't really have an ankle joint true, in the system to be able yeah. to absorb anything. So your knee has to take all of that. Takes okay. uh, the the, the push-off phase should be very, very similar. There, there may be some differences, but you should get a very similar and, yeah, phase okay. of it. Yeah. Now, without me knowing what I'm talking about, which, okay, that's probably slightly harsh, but in my mind, you go, hang on a minute. So if you're landing on the forefoot, you're, you're taking the load with the knee and the ankle, which you've just said, right? So you're kind of spreading the load a bit. 
But then when you're landing on your heel, it's mainly the knee. Is that right? So, so you'd think, hang on, isn't that slightly better because you're sort of spreading the load or is that too simplistic? I think it's too simplistic. Um, you, I mean, there enough, is a little is bit of, a, yeah. there is a little bit of spreading the load, but at the same time, if you were to take somebody who was not prepared to land on their forefoot and say, I want you to land on your forefoot, you've now increased that eccentric demand on their Achilles and their calf muscle by about two to three fold. And if they're yes. not prepared for that, you have a very ripe likelihood of developing some level of injury. Yes, yes. And then this fits very well with what Rasmus is saying. Everything's going to be gradual, 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 gradual. Exactly. So, so again, I, I guess what if you are prepared? Well, this is where it gets comp complicated because I guess I think you and Rasmus are saying if you're prepared for it, so you've, you've done it over and over and over and again, it doesn't really matter. Is that right? If you land on your forefoot or your, or your heel because you, you're ready for it and you've adapted to it. Is that yeah. So I think that's the key piece is that you're, you're adapted to it. Your body is adapted to it. Plus, ideally, the way I like to just think of it is you want to make sure that your body has, has a buffer built into it. It's, it's capacity. In other words, if running is the hardest thing you do, then that's going to be the most challenging thing that your body has to acclimate to. That's going to be its new test, you know, it, that, that it's new uh, bar for how strong it's going to get to to tolerate running. Mm -hmm. That gives you very little leeway to then change out, change running, to run uphill, to run yeah, faster, faster, to run greater mileage. Now your body has to adapt to those little changes. But if you can incorporate a level of training, and this might be resistance training, this can be plyometric work or whatnot, that increases the demand on your musculoskeletal system higher than running does alone. Okay. Then that gives you a bit of a buffer in your capacity to tolerate subtle changes in training. Right. And then and I and then it gets kind of complicated as well because it's specificity, right? So if you're doing if you're doing this is the funny one as well. I used to always think like calf raises, you should probably do them fast because you know then it's closer to running. But then often people will say, well, calf raises, you really want to have you know heavy resistance nice slow like two seconds up two seconds down i think well hang on but that's not specific so i guess do you know what i'm getting at uh, yeah, totally i think what you're getting yeah. at is the difference of function versus actual capacity so mm -hmm. i look at in the sense of if i want to make a muscle stronger there are certain dose parameters that I can use in my resistance training to ensure it's stronger. That doesn't mean it fires properly. That doesn't mean it's synchronized properly. That doesn't mean it's integrated into my whole system properly. Yeah. On the flip side, if all I do is train the function, hmm. I, can so, I can solve that functional solution by using other muscles. And so I may not ever get the strength demand and load to that key muscle that I'm after if I don't target it in a somewhat isolated manner, which is why with all of my patients, we talk about how there's room in the rehab and in prevention for both, right? You don't, if you only go to function, then you can end up with weak links in the chain. And if you mm -hmm. only go to isolated strengthening, then you can end up with not having that full integrated uh, a form and utilization piece. So the combination of the two in a progressive manner is where I, I always push right. individuals toward. So, so you do your, your non-related, non-specific to running kind of calf raises and things to get strong at exactly. doing that. But then you might try and do more sort of functional um, strengthening by, I don't know, maybe running again without overdoing it, but just running up, up hills a bit. More, or you know what that's that exactly right? right that's exactly right and there are other f forms of integration you can do but that yes you, your your point is exactly on all right now i, I know i kind of cut you off because you were talking about the the biomechanics and then i said oh hang on a bit you know isn't this going to be spreading the load bottom so i don't know if you remember where you were heading with with that um oh just in terms of why you know so much of the of the, so many uh, individuals with knee pain develop at the nice. time. And that's, again, based on that landing uh, stride, that the knee joint becomes, in most uh, rear foot strike runners, will absorb upwards of 55% of that energy during that loading phase of running, which is the first half of stance phase. 
Okay, and that's on the knee, so that they tend it's to get more knee. knee injuries, All right? And and now, I should I should say when I when I say knee, that's that's measured at the knee, but it doesn't mean it's absorbed through the cartilage of the knee. It can be just absorbed through the musculature of the knee as well. Yeah, right. Now I can't help, I guess, because I have interviewed the two others, so I think it, it is going to work, work out. I don't, I'm, I'm working this out as we go. I think people are going to have to watch the other ones, and then because I can't help saying, well. I know Irene would say dot, dot, dot. So I, I'm sorry if that's, it, there's benefits of, you know, you leaving the, the best to last, which is you, yeah. But also there's negatives because it means I'm going to keep thinking, well, hang on, but Irene said this. Sure. Now, is it, Irene sort of says, and it kind of surprises me a bit, and I think I kind of half challenged her when she said it, that there weren't really any running injuries until like 1970, you know, like, because that's when, and she said that's when the cushioned shoes came out and it forced people to land on the heel and things like that. I'm wondering what you think about that. I kind of said to her, well, there wasn't a running boom before then, so there weren't many people running, so there wouldn't be that many running injuries, and who knows if people were recording them or not. Um, so I'm just wondering what you would say um, in regards to that, because her her main thesis sort of thing was that we've adapted over millions of years to run with minimal, you know, we are born to run, but we didn't have these fat sole shoes. And not just that, that the fat sole shoes sort of make you land on your heel, rather than the forefoot. Now, Rasmus, you know, didn't seem that, he, you know, he wasn't that worried about the cushion shoes and said, if it's if it's not broke, just keep going. Uh, wondering what you think about that. I'm not trying to cause, you know, I'm just I'm just aware if people have watched all three, like like me, yeah. guess, um, you know, they say, well, what about that? What about this? You know? Mm -hmm. So I, I guess we'll start off with kind of a summary statement of my view with footwear. And again, I would probably side more with Rasmus that, Footwear, foot, shoe style is not that critical toward running injury prevention or running injury risk. Uh, again, there are always exceptions to that. And where I get more concerned about is when people frequently and rapidly change one style to another yes. style. You know, they, where they would go from a very cushioned shoe to a barefoot style, minimal shoe yes. uh, with without transitioning. You know, that, that I get concerned about. Um, but I think overall, I'm less, it's not a focus, focal point of my evaluation okay. or, or recommendations. I, to the point about running injuries, not really starting until the 70s, I, I, I share your opinion. I think it's probably more of a surveillance and, and reporting issue and, and interest in reporting issue. I mean, the, the entire running shoe business didn't exist at that time. And as we know, business drives a whole lot of, of, of interest. So us even tracking injuries in runners, there wouldn't have come out unless there was an interest in tracking injuries in runners. And running as a sport, as you mentioned, really hadn't started until around 72 with the first running boom. Hmm. Okay. Um, it is a funny one though, because, okay, because we have run for millennia, for ages, uh, and had had these minimalist shoes, yeah? Um, I don't know. I'm just thinking, does it make sense to have minimalist shoes? Do you know what I mean? Like, and, and the other thing is, do you think it does force you onto the heel or not? Um, so having thick shoes, does it force you onto the heel? I, I don't believe so. Um, and there's a handful of studies that have been done where they've taken people uh, who have not worn a certain type of shoe, given it to them and evaluated their foot strike pattern immediately after adopting or taking the shoes and weeks later. And ultimately, a small percentage of individuals change foot strikes as a result of changing shoes. Small percentage being like 20%, which means they have 75 to 80% stayed with the exact same foot strike pattern, regardless of the change in footwear. Um, and I think even if, if that argument were to hold, you, you would consistently see then that barefoot runners always landed on their midfoot or forefoot. Yet there are uh, several papers that have been published showing that upwards of 60, 70% of barefoot runners land on their rear foot. So again, I think I think this whole argument of it, it's too simplistic that this causes this, or if you run this way, this is going to happen with your foot strike. I honestly don't believe that foot strike is that critical to the injury epidemic, if we want to call it that. 
Okay, well, that's interesting. I think all, all three of you would agree about not changing things quickly. Yeah. So if you were going to try something, you would try try it over a long time. But you're saying, irrespective of that, you don't think um, the shoes make a lot of difference. So if you if you had someone on a cushion shoe and then you very gradually got them to a minimalist shoe, and you had someone on a minimalist shoe and you very gradually got them onto a, a cushion shoe, you feel like it wouldn't really affect. I think you just said 70% of them, it wouldn't actually affect how they land. And it wouldn't really, your feeling, but I don't know if it's been researched enough, is it wouldn't really affect injury rates. Correct. I think if it was done gradually as part of a full training program implementation, I think that that would, should not affect injury rates. Correct. Should try and get you three on together. That'd be awesome. Because <laughs> I just think, I think, what would Irene say though? What would Irene say? Okay. I've actually tried that a few times, have debates. I've had a few things. So there's a thing about zone two training, you know, like exercising mm -hmm. at really low intensity and other, and then, you know, some people say you should do that. And other people say all leads to all roads lead to Rome and I can't get them on together. They won't come on together. So, uh, mm -hmm. all right. So, um, great. All right. So I've, I've done a lot of sort of leading this. Why don't we talk uh, again, uh, uh, what you think, uh, you know, the main, reasons for, for, for injuries. So you started, you know, talking about landing on your knee versus, oh, sorry, landing on your knee, landing on your heel, you tend to put, uh, have more um, knee injuries. What about if you're landing on your forefoot? What do you have a, a different, so you're saying there, it tends to be the ankle. Yeah. It tends to be the ankle, forefoot, Achilles, Cast. calf. Yeah, exactly. So it's not as if there tends to be a shift in the, in the location of the injuries. You know, the, and the hard part is like doing, some of the epidemiology on that and comparing injury rates, there are far fewer habitual forefoot runners than rear foot runners. And so, you know, we, we do tend to see more of our injured injuries that we see happen to be in rear foot runners because that's more of who we end up seeing period. It's just where the, where the population mm -hmm. demographics are versus having a causative role in, in creating the injuries. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, it's a big piece of it. I would say, I think, you know, where I, from an injury risk perspective, the training elements that Rasmus's re research has really helped to elucidate, I think is, is a key element to it. I mean, we, we can't, you can't overestimate the importance of proper training. And I'm not, I'm not saying that we know what proper training is yet, <laughs> but we know there are some fundamentals like, you know, uh, like we've already talked about making sure that we gradually progress, making sure that we respect, you know, total cumulative load over mm -hmm. somebody's lifestyle, that there's balance with sleep, that it's balanced with life. Stress. There's a whole lot of factors that can play a role, but proper training is, is, key first and foremost. What we end up doing in clinical evaluations more than not is you look at, and what we look at is as a single stride, meaning we're trying to understand a person's load profile when running on a stride by stride level. So in the end, we can say, oh, based on how you run, your load is going to your knee joint. Well, what if I only run one mile? Does that really matter? versus if I run a hundred miles, right? So now it's taking that one stride that we've somewhat reduced down in practice and then try to assess, well, what happens if I do this or if I'm doing that? You know, if I added extra uh, training into it, how is that going to be affected by it? So one, one of our takeaways is if you are a hard runner, quote unquote, hard runner, heavy runner, um, aggressive runner in the sense of on a per stride level, if your magnitude of load is high on a per stride level, then we need to think about how many strides you're going to accumulate in a given mm -hmm. week or month or whatnot. And it stands to reason that if your body's capacity, right, if your strength, if your resilience is high, then you can probably tolerate hard running and high miles. But so there's really like three pieces to the equation, right? How much do you run? How hard do you run on a per stride basis? And then what's your body's ability to tolerate that, those demands? Mm -hmm. If your body's level is high, meaning it's strong, it's well-balanced, it's flexible, you know, all the things that you think about when you think of describing somebody as being fit and resilient, 
and their purse dried load is high, well, they can probably also tolerate a bit of higher levels of training. But if their body's capacity is low yeah. and they're a high demand purse dried runner, well, now the now they can't tolerate a high cumulative yeah, load either. Sense. That's going to have to stay somewhat low, is right. So there's there's three pieces of this equation. We can change the person and mm. their ability, their their overall capacity. We can change the per stride demand, which is gait retraining. Change how you how you land. Change your body's posture, your body's position, and then we can manipulate how many strides ultimately yeah. you're going to accumulate mm -hmm. during your training. Okay, well, that's interesting. Um, I guess you could also alter the the number of strides by how fast you go and things as well, right? You can. That would modify the number of strides, but then again, you would still get into then the total, the demand per stride goes up per with stride. speed. So what was the, okay, so when you said the heavy, the hard, the whatever, I tend to yeah. think of someone who's landing and going slap, 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 you know, making yeah. a lot of noise and things, but who knows? What, what, what is you now when you say a hard land or yeah. whatever what have you said what what is yeah. that and what's going on there yeah great question so i, I actually don't pay much attention to that, that slap that loud that that impact mm -hmm. piece because the actual magnitude of load at that exact moment of time is pretty darn small your greatest loads on your body are at mid stance right when you're when your foot is underneath your center of mass or just after that before that it's actually fairly low, especially early on when you're hearing that that slap. Um, so what we, how we tend to modify or look at it is, how much does your body's center of mass have to move up and down when you run? How much do you oh, bounce? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a mark of how much what your acceleration deceleration load is going to be like. Whether mm -hmm. it's absorbed at the ankle, the knee, the hip. That's okay. kind of irrelevant. That gets into the details of what tissues are going to be loaded. But the center of mass displacement gives us a sense okay. of total demand that your body has to deal with. And that's the thing when you look at Elliot Kipchoge, for example, you know, and he's running, it looks like you could almost sit a plate on his head and it wouldn't fall off. Right. Sort of thing. Exactly. Right. And if you go um, back to, um, to Michael Johnson as well, same. I mean, just absolutely flat. Wow. So even though he's leaning back, he wasn't actually – Going up and down. He wasn't, he wasn't so bouncing a lot. So yeah. Bouncing up and down is the, is the main problem. Now, I, I was interested that, okay, so what, so what can people, so, yeah, so getting, so you've mentioned gait retraining. Um, do you, would you actually go, okay, and I also keep thinking about Rasmus, if it's not broke, don't fix it. So <laughs> when do you actually think about that? So if you've got someone going up and down, bounce, 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 but they're not getting injured, you know what I mean? Don't, I don't deal with it. I don't mm -hmm. deal with it, except there's a little bit of work done from the early 80s, that's the mid 80s, that showed that runners who are more, who consume less oxygen at a given mm -hmm. speed bounce less. Their vertical displacement of their center mm -hmm. of mass is less compared to a similarly trained cohort at the same speed who Makes has sense. to consume more oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. So it, could there be a performance related reason to make this change? Possibly. Yeah. That's and that's I'm not a coach. I'll be first and foremost to say mm -hmm. that I, I don't train runners. I try to work with runners to keep them injury reduced injury yep. risk. Um, so I tend to look through the lens of uh, if yeah, if you don't have an injury history that has relevance here, I'm not going to change anything. Even mm -hmm. though you have a high demanding way of running, you know what? If your if your capacity if your strength, if your resilience to tolerate that is good, then I'm not as worried. It's those person, the people who have started to lose some of that capacity and resilience where you start to see now the injuries catching up to them with that sort of demanding running style. And so we can either rebuild themselves, rebuild their strength and their capacity to tolerate again, which depending on what point in your life you are and how much time you have, and how patient you're going to be with that process yeah. is one option. But more oftentimes than not, there, there's also the other option of at the same time, tweaking, adjusting, my, minorly adjusting your running style to reduce some of that bounce. Okay. So is that the main – so so as you mentioned with Irene, we talked about some gait changes. Again, if people are injured, you, 
as you say, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, it doesn't make sense to change it if people aren't right. getting it. Although, as you said, that's interesting because it makes sense if you're going up and down, you're fighting gravity more basically. So it makes sense you'd be, you'd be using more oxygen right? and being less econ economical, less efficient. So yeah, as yeah. you say, unless you wanted to try and tweak that, but even then that would be kind of scary, wouldn't it? Because you're going, okay, you're not injured, but let's go and tweak something to try and make you more energy efficient. But yeah. anyway, so is it as simple though, as if you do have someone that's injured and they are, and what if they, okay, I guess they could be getting injured and they're not bouncing up and down, but let's assume they're getting injured and they're bouncing up and down. Mm -hmm. is, do you essentially just tweak whatever you can to try and reduce that bounce or get, yes. again, is that just too simplistic? No, okay. no, that's exactly what we try to do is look to see what, where would be the source of that. And that could be their takeoff angle that they're, when they go to push off the ground, they're pushing up versus up and forward a little bit okay. or it could be that they've got a really really long stride in order to run with a long stride and land with your foot way ahead of you you people tend to bleep to get there okay, and so they okay. they they arced they launch themselves i see and so we may work on something as simple as landing with your foot more underneath you it'll never get right underneath you it can't be you can't yeah, run up okay. forward <laughs> and yeah. land with your foot underneath you unless you're just accelerating at which point you can't always be accelerating um but the idea of getting at least closer to your center of mass when you land uh that oftentimes can have a positive role or we may even go simple totally simple and and change the number of steps per minute uh, yes. as, a, as a teaching tool to learn what we're after not that there's a magic step rate because there's not, okay. uh, but at least it will, it reinforces to the runner how to change or what we're after with these, with these verbal cues. Yeah. Okay. So I knew I've seen some of your papers about talking about uh, step rates and things like that. Yeah. So I was wondering, if, I think, assuming we'd get to that. And I know there's often people talking about um, overstriding. Right. So I know when you look at swimmers, like the, the best swimmers, they 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 look like they're going really slow because they've got these long big glide stroke, stroke yeah. uh, lengths like our like our um, Ian Thorpe torpedo we had right you're in like a, a hundred meter sprint it's like just go faster you know because because he's just doing so much work under the water and he's going really slow now same with runners so I guess you look at these Kenyan distance runners and they they got these really long stride lengths so there's a, there's a there's a tendency to want to like try and make your stride length longer. So there's a lot of talk about this overstriding, and 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 you said that would make you go up and down. Now, first of all, is that true? Are people tending to overstride uh, generally? And and is so? I guess what you're doing, if you're overstriding, you're sort of like taking too many long steps and not enough shorter steps. So you're saying you you would do more uh, more steps and less length per step. Is that right? That's the that's the general idea behind it, yes. But I will preface it with overstriding and long stride length are not necessarily the same thing. Oh, okay. So majority of your stride length happens during float phase when you're in the air, right? Mm -hmm. So similar to, to gliding with swimming, like you described with your analogy. If you then come down and land and your foot is way out ahead of you, at that point of contact, that's going to create a breaking force, right? Mm -hmm. Your foot is now out ahead mm -hmm. of you. Ugh, it's going to slow you down. No, It doesn't matter how fast you're running. Yeah. It's going to slow you down. And then you have to speed up again each step. So it's where that foot position is at landing relative to your body center of mass. That distance is what we define as overstriding. If you're well ahead of your center right. of mass at contact, that's a bigger breaking force working against you. The closer you can bring it to your center of mass, knowing that it's never going to get right underneath it, but right. the closer you can bring it, the less negative consequence it has on your center yeah. of mass and consequently the less bounce you end up having as well. Okay. So just make sure people are clear because I'm picturing it and I've seen all these videos where they'll draw a line. So when you, when you land, you want your knee essentially over your foot, as you said, it can't be perfect, but you don't want, it makes sense that if you land and your lower leg is sort of like a, a head of your knee, then as you say, that's like a breaking, you're actually slowing, you're breaking every time you land. 
Yeah. Right. When you land exactly kind of an ideal scenario, your knee joint center and your ankle joint center are right above each other. Yeah, exactly. So your, your lower leg, your shank, your tibia is essentially vertical. Yeah. Now, again, we, we give a, we give a little bit of tolerance yeah, to what yeah. that would be, but we just don't want the knee to be uh, overextended. Right. And that's, that's, I guess that's inefficient. And maybe that kind of explains a bit, you know, how you said, if you're bouncing up and down, Right. Uh, you use more oxygen. It kind of makes sense if you've got a bit of a breaking. If you were overstriding and your your foot was ahead of your knee much and you were kind of breaking, it would make sense that's kind of inefficient. Maybe you'd be using more oxygen as well. So that would kind of maybe explain a little bit of this bouncing up and down. Yep. Now, the other thing I, I was just thinking and I've forgotten. Oh, yeah. It also feels like maybe if you're, if you're overstriding a bit and having to break, would that also put a lot of kind of eccentric load on the knee yeah, and on the quads? as well it's exactly yeah. right it's, it's exactly right. so when you overstride that eccentric demand at the knee goes up quite a bit and is simply changing that overstriding position you can reduce the demand on the knee upwards of 20 to 30 percent with oh. only a, a, a couple of centimeters of bringing that foot closer to your center of mass yeah, because I guess like we were saying with the bicep curls, when you're lowering it and you're kind of breaking it, that's eccentric. So when you're breaking, you know, when you're landing with your knee, um, you know, behind the foot, you're actually having to break, which is more eccentric load, I guess, right. probably almost almost by definition. Okay, right. so so you would try and tweak. So what would you do? I know you said it's like as a learning exercise, you would get them to what do more strides, shorten their stride. So if you've got this person that's bounce, 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 getting all these injuries. <laughs> And you, I guess you would do your your examination and see, okay, he he or she is mm -hmm. landing with their knee behind their foot. So what would you do there? So typically what we would do is even if we started and decided that step rate might be the first option because it's it's a rhythm. It's not trying to mentally, they're not trying to decipher what you're verbally saying. I want you to land like this or with this yeah, exactly. any angle. That's so hard for someone to conceptualize and internalize. Mm -hmm. But a rhythm is is very easy for just about anybody to do. And so mm -hmm. we pull out a, a metronome and we'll increase it by two beats per, per minute or four beats per minute. When you consider most runners are somewhere around 160 to 190, depending on the running speed, we're talking Strides a very small amount, minute. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Per minute, we're talking about changing it by, okay. you know, That's all of, of one to 3% uh, in the end. And many times that has a very demonstrable effect on their center of mass displacement. Oh, really? So just and that symptoms. Little... Oh, yep. wow. Yep. A little it's bit. enough to change the angle of the knee of the yep. knee and angle. Okay. Yep. Okay. I mean, but our research has been done using more fixed amounts, like five percent or or ten percent, to, to to show the clear the clear effect size that it has. But that doesn't mean that you had you have to go to five or ten in order to get a meaningful response. You can even get pain reduction, okay. reduced bounce at two three percent change. Okay. And does that, does that flow through? I guess it's hard to do because you've got to follow them for ages and you've got to have a big end, but does that flow through to less injuries as well or, or, or them getting back to running quicker or something? Yeah, that's the missing piece. Exactly what you said is like these long-term scale follow-ups to be able to see implementation wise, does this have a positive effect on re-injury rates and others? Uh, we haven't been able to, to conduct a study of that size. Interestingly, when a few years ago, we did have a full randomized trial designed and implemented and rolled out. And we ended up with, I guess, for lack of a better ter term, contamination from our, our clinicians because they refused to uh, randomize people to the control group because they had such confidence that our implementation it's was working work. no. <laughs> that they would, they would not withhold treatment from uh, patients. Well, and then you get, I just, it's just reminded me, I had an interview with David Martin, people can go back and look at that. And his uh, whole thing was uh, not the whole thing, but the big thing was belief system. So if you believe yeah. something, so even having like, you know, your degrees behind you, which you don't, I, I don't do that either, but he has all his degrees back there and people look at, say, Oh, he must know what he's talking about. So then you tend to, believe him more right. um so i guess if the if the clinicians are believing it then you've almost got you know you can't have a placebo thing as well it makes it very difficult you know, if they're exactly like oh right. unfortunately you're in this group it's like okay <laughs> <laughs> exactly
Yeah. Right. All right. Right. So cadence is one. That, now I'm just again interested in oh, what we're going to say. What would I? Mean? Is, there, is there any any debate there? Does everyone agree that that's a good way to do things to try and reduce uh, injuries? Or? I, I, again, I think this is one where Irene would argue, nah, don't cadence isn't that important. I would just shift everybody to their forefoot. That would be, generally would be her response. And I think Rasmus, you know, being the uh, I don't, I'm not sure how much he's done with gate retraining, but I think he's definitely of the opinion of don't fix it if it ain't broken. And if it is broken, then make sure it's very unique to the individual and how they present to you. And which, I, again, I've, I 100% endorse as well. Um, but when back to our point about knee pain and how do we change bounce and knee pain, this would be one of our approaches to it. Okay. Now, I'm also conscious because you, you mentioned how... Um... I think Irene's looked at a, a, a bunch of different people, but quite often recreational runners. I think you said mm -hmm. you. Um, anyway, I'm just wondering, recreational runners versus serious runners versus obviously they're going faster, right? So I, I mm -hmm. picked up earlier when you said most people actually land on their heel. My feeling was that the the fastest runners, um, quite a lot of them do land kind of forefoot. Is that right or, or not really? Well, I, you, I think you will see a greater proportion that land on their forefoot compared to, you know, more recreational paced runners. Uh, but for example, most of our research is done with, with uh, elite collegiate level runners who okay. end up going on the U S Olympic team and oh, you know, national okay. champions and whatnot. And a good percentage of, I would say at least 50, 50, if not 60, 40 are, yeah. are rand are landing on their rear foot compared to the forefoot. Right. And again, just to, drive it home you would say it's not because they're wearing thick it's not because they've got the cushion shoes yeah i, I don't believe no huh? and what about because they're, they're actually almost all wearing very similar shoes uh because of 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 contracts and sponsorship that the university yeah. might have with different shoe companies and That's what's true. available we have very few runners at this point uh who wear who wear minimal shoes and yet they will still land on their forefoot and, and likewise, those same individual or those individuals with the same shoes will land on their rear foot. So I don't see that as the driver. Yeah. Now, the other thing was you, you touched on earlier, and I'm not quite sure on it myself, is um, the work rate, or you, you called it, you said, Irene, and you disagree on it. What is that? Oh, actually, loading what, rate. What is, sorry, loading. Yeah, loading, loading rate. rate. What is actually, yeah. what does that actually mean, sorry? So the loading rate is is the rate at which load is increasing as measured in this case, what I'm referring to specifically is the vertical loading rate, which is the forces between as measured between the foot and the ground. There's a force plate that we oftentimes measure. Mm -hmm. So when you land it at the ground, those forces between the ground being imparted to you through your foot are going to be increasing. And the rate at which they increase during this about the first 100 milliseconds or so of a, of a stride cycle, uh, that is really important to, to predict injury risk mm -hmm. in, in somebody. And Irene believes it's, it is important. Our research and our data suggest it's not. And again, I don't want to put words in Irene's mouth. That's no, no. not it at all. I'm, I'm, I'm speculating as to how I think she would re respond here and how she's written in some of her work. Um, but we, we tend to, uh, our findings at least show that it's not that important to injury risk. So is it right? Cause we kind of talked about this for people on YouTube will see, it's kind of like a hand I'm putting up my hand is you get the spike when you land on the heel and then you get another, um, right. And the idea is if you land on the forefoot, it'd be more flat, but you, you don't, you don't necessarily see that or you don't think it's important that initial spike, I guess. No, so I, I I see the exact pattern that you're describing and that Irene measures. I don't think it's important that initial spike, the slope okay. of that initial force build up to that first peak. Hmm. All right. Now, what um what other bits and pieces are we wanting to talk about here? So we've talked about the cadence, yeah. So what yeah. other things? So so you've got this person that's injured, yeah, and they're bouncing. The main thing you do is try and reduce. The bounce, yeah. So the bounce and, was... and, and so I would say bounce and overstride are two of our biggest uh, metrics that we look at to determine whether or not we need to 
modify running gait. And they they may come together on the same person. Yeah. They may be separate. One person might overstride and not bounce. So it's really looking at the individual mechanics. Okay, okay. And, and your ways of changing that. So if they're overstriding and not bouncing and bounce, are they both changing this, the the rate of steps? Is that so, right? so step rate does affect both, correct? But we also may choose other verbal cues to it as well. Um, and there can be an approach like we talked before, even a little bit about trying to promote more, bit of more of a forward lean. Uh, for some people, that cueing can really get them to avoid overstride. Uh, which is great. Uh, it's, a, it's a good option to use. For some people, it doesn't work at all. So as much as anything, the, the technique you apply that we would apply is more, much more from a, of, a, of an instructional manner. Which one is, is the athlete going to best learn from and implement what your goal is? The goal being stop overstriding, but yes. which cue am I going to give them to achieve that that's going to be highly dependent on the athlete. Okay. Do we have a, do you have a feel for what percentage of people are, are actually overstriding? So less, the more experienced the runner, typically the less. So okay. there's some decent data to show that in the first five years, your, that overstride distance or your step rate at a given speed tends, your step rate increases at a given speed. So you okay. actually learn to shift that landing position back a little bit. Okay, and and the and the obviously the more um, more you've been running, the faster you are. So so you're actually finding because you tend to think. Um, so at the same time that they're, they're getting faster and 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 getting a, a greater stride length. Why don't, so why I'm don't saying, you just explain that. Yeah, what's happening? Are yeah, I'm saying at, at, at the, yeah, hmm. as a person gains running experience and you t look at them at the same speed, so hold yeah. speed constant. Okay. They will tend to shorten their mechanics at that speed, uh, yeah. land more underneath them, have a higher turnover. Now, again, yes, you, they typically will gain speed as a result of fitness over there as well. And that, in the end, can shift where their landing position might be also. But at a given speed, they've learned yeah, to be okay. more efficient. So yeah. as they do get far, so assuming that you know they've been running longer, they're getting better, they're getting faster. Does that, does that, uh, what happens with the, the, the overstriding does it tend to because i know you're saying at the same speed they have less overstriding but do they tend to also like how do they get faster basically is it is it the, the stride length is it the stride rate is it a bit of both and are they landing better as well at, at the, at the yeah, that's a good speed? question they're really I've, I've not seen great data on that to show enough to be able to say that as people get faster Oh, you know, that's a, a really good longitudinal study that would need to happen on, on a performance basis. And I, I'm not aware of anything to date on that. Okay. And do we know, so if you go, okay, so if you go to the sort of the extreme and look at the elite runners and, and say, well, they've obviously got faster <laughs> at some stage. If you look at them, do they tend to land, you know, on average better? You know, like, do they tend to not overstride um, compared to recreational runners, for example? Do you know? Um, good question. I would say yes to that effect in general. Um, recreational runners, especially in that first year or two, is where we really see much more of the overstriding and bounce ideas as they're really just learning how to run and becoming more uh, efficient in it. So the more experienced runners, we generally will see improved mechanics. Um, yeah, in general. Yeah, because I guess you start off just sort of unco, as we used to say in school, uncoordinated um, running, especially because I think we've just lost, you know, as kids, they just run everywhere, right? But we tend to lose that. Then you have to sort of almost learn to run again. But then you get more just efficient, I guess. And 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 I, is that what happens, do you think? You just tend to, to less overstride as you get more used to it, kind of settle. Yeah, I, th I think it's naturally natural for your body to learn to become more efficient as you start to do things right. And you always want to, especially with a sport like, like distance running, which is all about efficiency, speed, clearly you want to get from point A to point B as fast as you can, but because it's a distance, you want to consume the least amount of oxygen or the least amount of energy to do it, um, you know, to cover as much distance as possible. So I, I think that's a natural, a natural adaptation that you'll have to the sport. I was going to say, I guess, based on that, then as you become more efficient, you should probably get less injured. But the problem is with that, 
as you know, you said before, you keep the speed the same. The problem with that, you, you wouldn't do that. So as you're getting better and getting more efficient, then and you're not overstriding as much, then you should get injured less. But I guess you're actually starting to push it more. You're running more. You 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 know more more distance, more hills, more intervals, more everything. So I guess it gets complicated to work out. Are they getting injured less? As they're getting well, exactly, injured. yeah, because you're being exposed to the, the injury mechanism more. <laughs> yes, potentially, yeah. Now you had something. Uh, what was this? I just uh, looking through Twitter. Now you don't have. You're not on Twitter, are you? I'm think. not on Twitter. But like when I type, you I'm, in, not on, I do... I'm not on any socials except for LinkedIn, and that's just okay. Because yeah. when I I always often put into Twitter, and I see people have, have put up things from your talks. For oh, example, okay. <laughs> even though you're not on there, if you type right. in your name, stuff comes up. So one oh, was, um, yeah, one, someone said zero evidence for changing running mechanics as a method to prevent future injury. Is that right? Or do they get that wrong? And well, at, at one point in time, that was, that was accurate. There, to date, and I'm, I'm only aware of one study more recently that has been more of a randomized trial where they took a group of runners and changed their gait and then looked at injuries over the next year or not change their gait and looked at injuries over the next year. And what this particular study found was that those who underwent gait retraining had fewer injuries over the next year compared to those who did change or who, who did not change their mechanics. That's the only one that I'm aware of as a trial, as a clinical trial where that's looked at injury as a function of gait retraining or not in healthy individuals. And it did reduce their injury. It did, based on the study. Now, the challenge to it is, I mean, no study's perfect. And by no means am I going to nitpick on the, the study because following a group of runners for a year is, is a very challenging thing to do. But there was no mention of whether they were adherent to the gait retraining after they finished the supervised training um, there was no evidence of, in, of or no indication of exposure, what training was like, how much did, were they running, were they still running or not. So there were some pieces there that I think there's a missing elements that we would need to do to be able to say, boy, there's really something here versus saying there's something, there's enough here that to suggest we need to study it further. Which okay. I think where it's at right now. Now, I'm just looking at my notes here. I know we've got to finish up soon. You've got a meeting coming up. Um, I asked Irene, is there any questions she would have for you? <laughs> <laughs> and um, and then I said, is it okay if I mentioned that she sent it to me? So, so I hope I'm not throwing her under the bus or something. But um, Irene said, Brian is about cadence, but I like to remind him that when you transition from rear foot strike to, rear, to four foot strike, I'm, I'm pleased to see you're, you're smiling in the background there because the camera will be on me. You automatically increase your cadence, right? So she's got uh, Futural and uh, Irene's last author, 2020 transition to four foot strike reduces load rates more effectively than altering cadence. Do you have any thoughts? Maybe just explain that a bit. And, and do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think if you, I think her point about changing step rate will change with foot strike. I agree that's generally the case. You know, there are some individuals who adopt a four foot strike pattern who prance. They essentially overstride. And that's that's not a good solution. Um, but let's assume that they are, have effectively done it. Yeah, there there is a there's a definite association between step rate and foot strike, no doubt. Um I think the I heard the point of her the paper that she cites that foot strike better at, uh, reduces loading rates than cadence, I would agree with that as well. It's much more direct mechanism to it. But this reiterates my, my, my statement that I don't think loading rate really matters that much anyway. <laughs> so that's the outcome of interest. I would say it's the wrong outcome. Okay. Okay. But, um, She's saying when you go from raw foot, rear foot to forefoot, you increase your cadence. So that should help with the not overstriding, though. Is that right? It should. It should, yes. Yep. All right. But you still... So, I, again, I, I think that's an option. But the, to me, the difference is if you if your solution then is to have somebody land on their forefoot to avoid overstriding, what sort of load demands have you just applied to their calf and Achilles? And are they going to be able to adequately 
handle it without having to stop and recondition those tissues for several months to get it ready. Because, te because tendon adaptation is a slow process. It's a four to six month process. Okay. So there's never a situation where you would say if someone's getting injured. Um, okay. So what, what other things, if they're not bouncing up and down and they're not overstriding, do you find that much where people are getting injured? But they're not doing. Oh, that. sure. Then what do you? Yeah, do? yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, there, there's always a, there's a whole lot of different sort of running mechanics you can see in your evaluation, whether it's, you know, the, the lack of control through the knee joint, or individuals who've had a history of knee surgery who don't have good quad control that are keeping their knee uh, hyperextended, and they actually have a, a a higher turnover and a very little stride length. Okay. Um, and very little knee flexion. Instead of the idea of too much knee flexion, they don't have enough. Right. Um, or you can see things at their hip joint and their back. I mean, there, there's a lot of, of individual yeah, of pieces to it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, again, if we're thinking of what's what are some common reoccurrent common. elements, ah. uh, those are two of the big ones. Actually, I'm just remembering now. Now, I'm interested in your thoughts about... Um, so... I think Rasmus and Irene are both saying that you know, everyone's always worried about trying to stop this so-called excessive pronation. Yeah. Mm. And there's all these, you know, motion control shoes trying to stop this excessive pronation and orthotics and all these sorts of things. And they were basically saying that there isn't a whole lot of evidence that, um, you know, neutral shoes, if you're used to them, you know, you, you just get the same injury rates as you do with these motion controls. Uh, do, any thoughts on that? Because that's obviously a huge thing. All the running shops are always, mm -hmm saying you should try and reduce this excess pronation. So for, for people uh, to know, that's when you're landing on the the kind of the outside and rolling in. Yeah. Right. Uh, I, I think you found the one item that all three of us absolutely agree on. Uh, and that is that uh, the excessive pronation or rate of pronation is, is probably an area that is getting way too much attention. And it's not surprising that the source of the attention is not from scientists and clinicians as much as it is, from you know uh, shoe sales uh, because that that's one of the things that that distinguishes one type of shoe from another is that element. So mm -hmm. it, it becomes a, a point of of distinction between individuals. But the value of it toward injury risk, injury risk reduction, nah, very little. That's interesting. So so not only do you not have to worry about this so called excess pronation, but are you saying if you wear a shoe that tries to prevent that versus wear a shoe that doesn't try to prevent it or whatever. It doesn't actually make much difference to injury rates. Well, there, there's some early work that actually suggests that this type of shoe that if you wear a shoe that is really what we would call a motion controlling shoe uh, designed to reduce pronation, but really just designed to reduce a whole lot of motion, those actually might create more painful episodes than any other running shoe, regardless of what type of foot you have regardless of how you run. So there's some suggest that certain shoes might be really detrimental for certain populations. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So I know you're fin getting a bit tight on time here. Is there anything we've, uh, we haven't chatted about that you'd like to bring up? Um, no, I think oh, this has been, this has been good. Um, it's nice to be, uh, you know, in the context of Irene and Rasmussen's thoughts and put that in perspective, but Happy to answer any other questions you have on our work, whether it's sprinting related, hamstring related, or distance running. So you have a few more minutes though, or? Uh, yeah, I got a couple more. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. So yeah, I guess I guess um, we haven't talked about sprinting really because I am a bit of a yeah, endurance type got mindset. Um, I know you've done a lot of work with um, hamstring injuries, and I think that was more yeah. sprinting. Is that right? Did you want to talk That's about right. that a little bit? Or? Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, as you mentioned, like, you know, a lot of stuff we've talked about for so far with, with distance running is all about stance phase, you know, foot hits the ground. How do you absorb that load? How do you generate energy to get off the ground again? Hamstring injuries in, in running, again, it's not a distance running injury. When people have, have hamstring involvement in their distance running, odds are it's a tendinopathy of sorts. Mm -hmm. That part of the tendon of the hamstring is irritated, but it's not a true hamstring strain. Yeah, right. Um, so that becomes much more of a sprinting injury when you get above 80% of your maximum speed, right? 90% or, or all the way to your max speed. You start to see these more frequently. The, the biomechanical data 
And our best evidence to date suggests that it's a swing phase injury. So it's when mm -hmm. your leg is out ahead of you yeah. and you're having to decelerate, decelerate it as it swings yeah, yeah, forward. Yeah. That's all eccentric yeah. demand mm -hmm. on that hamstring muscle that creates a, a, a overload to it, a strain to it. Yep. So it's slowing down. Yeah. So you, you're sort of throwing your leg out That's right. and, and your knees having to, again, it's almost like it's not overstriding, but it's again, it's the same sort of thing almost in a way, isn't it? That you've, your lower legs going ahead of your knee, your hamstrings right. having to contract eccentrically as they're lengthening to slow it down. And that's where most of the injury occurs. Is that right? Exactly. Exactly. You know, and people forget a lot of times that how, how much force can be generated from inertia. Right. It's not just your body hitting the ground. They always think about that's where the most force is. Well, no, the, the acceleration of your leg swinging forward and the force it generates from the muscle to de to decelerate that is quite substantial. Yep. Okay. Yep. That makes sense. Now, um, and is there a specific training people should do sort of, so I've had Kirsten Thorborg on here. Yeah. He did a lot of eccentric focus sort of training. Yep. Um, does that make sense to, to do? Yeah. It does. I mean, that, and that's one of the ideas where like using probably the most common exercise across the world for strengthening the hamstrings eccentrically is the Nordic hamstring exercise, exactly. uh -huh. you know, and, and so that becomes a real common one, but it doesn't mean it's the best one. It's just the one that's been most studied because it's very easy to implement in a group setting. So you can do it as part of a warm up and so on. But nonetheless, there's use doing eccentric exercises to the hamstring muscle appears to make the most common sense to handle that eccentric dominate injury mechanism. Um, so yes, it's, it's very, very commonly uh, prescribed. And in fact, when groups do implement it on a routine basis, they, they've reported upwards of 50% reduction in hamstring strains. Okay. Wow. That's, that's, that's massive. Yeah. Um, now I've got it, someone on Twitter here, Danny uh, DeWitt. She said, returning to running injuries after stress factors with low bone density. Um, now, because I wanted to bring that up because I've seen more recently you've been doing uh, quite a lot of stuff with bone. So I thought it might mm -hmm. give you a chance to mention that. And she also, I, I guess, couldn't help herself saying, uh, and from a national champion Badger alumni, <laughs> go Badgers. So um, <laughs> this is the person, uh, Danny De DeWitt. Uh, any thoughts about that, returning from injury after stress factors and, and your, some of your bone research? Yeah, no. So the, the, that research, I think that she's citing, it actually is not our work, but it's out of some colleagues. And we, we absolutely respect their their data. And I, I always want to make sure we share the best information out there. They tracked bone density in the tibia following a tibial bone stress injury and found that the bone density in the tibia did not return to uh, pre-injury levels, essentially, until three to six months after they return to sport after they were cleared. So a lot of times we think okay. about, oh, once you're ready to build up running again, your bone is healed and ready to go. And we have to remember that it's the injury is essentially healed, but there's still a relative deconditioning that's happened, not just to the bone, but to really all these tissues, mm. which begs okay. for the reason of why we do take such a gradual buildup to get everything back again is because there's, there's a biological time requirement we can't speed up that recovery and that rebuilding that right. that is biological and takes its time and it's reminding me now i've seen you've got papers also saying you've got a paper saying mri evidence that people returning um after acl injury right it, it may not it may not be ready to go what what was that what did you find there yeah so that's another big question is after an acl reconstruction what when are people ready to run again or to resume mm -hmm. running and more, very many times that's just been a time dependency. People have said, oh, four months or three months where we can start running. And what we found is that running mechanics are, are heavily compromised for well over a year after coming back from an ACL reconstruction. And just simply exposure to running doesn't naturalize or normalize their mechanics. Uh, it there are many times it takes a concerted effort for one, as I mentioned, you have to have adequate quadriceps strength coming off a of surgery like mm -hmm. that to tolerate running. And two, many times there's there's gait retraining involved 
to essentially reteach them how to run, much like you would reteach somebody how to walk after a major, major injury. There may be a, a need to reteach them how to run or to at least yeah. get them to, um, to, to load that knee joint in a symmetrical way compared to how they used to. Now you, are, you, one thing I didn't mention is you're actually a physical therapist, which we call a yep. physiotherapist here. So, so that's a nice mix. Obviously, you're thinking in that way, and it, and it comes yes. across when we're talking. All okay. right, well, that's great. Um, I know you need to race off to another meeting, so thank you for for your time. But what I like to do at the end is um, have a bit of a takeaway messages. And actually, someone was, I think it's called um, Exercise Biology on Twitter said, "If there's three things you want the world to know." about your your research or or about running injuries what would they be so yeah some takeaway messages oh boy on running injuries um one i think is the the, the mechanics of interest for us are big picture pieces bounce and overstriding i think if you if we can address those then we can get into the into the small details but most oftentimes those details will take care of themselves if we address overstriding and bounce. Two, if you're going to sprint <laughs> and speed is your thing, respect 80 to 100% of max speed and how you train through that region. Um, your risk of injury exponentially goes up from 80 to 100%. So make sure you take the time to build accordingly. And then thirdly, I think as respect to or to um, uh, post-surgical as well, is use running and returning to running, not, not so much as a, uh, a, a clearance point, but rather that are you doing it well? Are you doing it effectively as a marker for when ultimately you're going to return to your sport of interest? Right. Great. Okay. Now, thank you very much for your patience. I guess it was a bit very different if you'd come first. To coming third so thanks for your patience and been uh, happy to clarify and do it in a good spirit and all that the previous talks i think it i, I actually feel like it's brought everything together quite well but um great yeah no, okay. no problem at all. thanks glenn i appreciate the invitation again thank you great okay see you mate bye-bye bye, -bye. bye now bye. i hope you enjoyed this podcast and please like subscribe pass it on to your friends and colleagues check out the other podcasts thanks again